wow, this guy has no clue. That's what I thought to myself, sitting in the lecture hall, listening to Dr. So-and-so from XYZ University. In fact, the doctor next to me leaned over and says, he doesn't have any idea what it takes to take care of patients in a real office, does he? Hi, this is Dr. Michael Orozco. In my previous position as clinic director at TLC Laser Eye Center, I tripled the number of procedures during my tenure. I succeeded because I educated and supported the doctors at growing the LASIK portion of their practice. My success was also due to the fact that I literally have been in their shoes. I've been in private practice alone, in partnership, and in corporate optometry next to a chain optical. I knew exactly what they need to succeed and take care of the patients on a day-to-day -day basis. I also appreciated the opportunity to work with the marketing department and professional affairs department at TLC to put together a program that the doctors could implement within their practice to become successful. In my current position as the lead optometrist at a multi-specialty ophthalmology practice, I work with challenging patients on a daily basis. Patients with pellucid degeneration, keratoconus, post-PKP, post-RK, post-LASIK, and scarred and irregular corneas. I know what I want as a practitioner from a contact lens company. I also know the products and the support that I need from the company in working with my difficult patients. I've attached a couple of short videos of local interviews I've done that I think you will find helpful. I will say I would much rather hear from a doctor giving a presentation who has actually had clinical experience in private offices and in other settings in working with these patients on a daily basis. Y también hablo español. Puedo comunicar con los doctores en España, México y Sudamérica. I believe that my experience would be a great benefit to Contamac and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Well, so many people suffer from severe dry eyes. If you are one of those people, you don't have to give up hope because there is a new treatment and it, it may be just what you've been looking for. Dr. Michael Orozco is here. He is with Medical Center Ophthalmology Associates. Cynthia King is a patient. Thank you both for being here this morning. Thank you. You know, this is a really common problem, isn't it? It's very prevalent, very undertreated and underdiagnosed. What are the causes of severe dry eye? Well, we used to think it was lack of water in the tears, but now we know it's actually lack of oil in the meibomian glands and the lids. Uh, those glands get clogged up and then the tears can't flow onto the surface of the eye. Now, is this something people are born with or can this happen over time depending on your life? Uh, it develops over a period of time yeah. generally. Um, side effects of medications, uh, lifestyle, people that work on the computer a lot, they don't blink at their normal rate. Okay. Um, folks who work under where there's ceiling fans all the time or if they're outdoors and there's wind blowing. Wind. Um, hormonal changes in ladies are a factor. Um, after LASIK surgery, mm -hmm. it's very common to have dry eyes as well. And I think until you actually are dealing with it and suffering from it, you don't understand how almost debilitating mm -hmm. it can be in your everyday life. I, I imagine it would be miserable, Cynthia, because you were living with it. I, I was. I. I have worn contacts since I was 15 and um, it just uh, came to a point about a little over a year and a half ago I just uh, I would put the contacts on and within five or ten minutes it was like a big oily thumbprint right in the middle so I went to my uh, optometrist and he diagnosed with me with uh, dry eye syndrome uh -huh. we began a series of uh, treatments that he knew to do uh, I was on restasis for uh, really a full year, and of course my, my main focus, I wanted to get back into my contacts. Right. I, I, I was so used to that. It was so uncomfortable for yeah, you. Yeah, I, I was uh, of course having uh, some eye infections because when you're not having the proper uh, lubrication there, I was constantly carrying my uh, refresh or sustain, right. all those I had in the car. Well, that's a pain. It, well, it really is, right. and having to wear, you know, adapt back into glasses, so. Well, but here's the good thing is 
you met Dr. Orozco. Well, I did. I and, went to one of his seminars. Uh -huh. And you actually. went to a seminar. And, mm -hmm. and tell us about the procedure that Cynthia had done that is really is changing people's lives. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, it's uh, the only FDA-approved treatment to restore the function of the meibomian glands, which, again, is 80% of the cause of dry eyes. Um, but the procedure is called Lipiflow, and it's a 12-minute procedure. It's painless. We put a numbing drop in the eye, the same one we use to check pressures. Uh -huh. So we just put a numbing drop, place the eye pieces under the lids. Is that what we're looking, at, what here? We're looking at here? Okay. And the patient just lays back, uh, and the procedure does a slight warming sensation to soften the dried mucus in the glands and a light massage to extract that dried mucus out of the glands to restore the function. Wow, so it's really quick, it's, it's painless, and then after the procedure, people are good to go for yeah, the most part? there's no downtime whatsoever. Um, you can literally get up and go back to your normal activity. That is wonderful. Now, who is the candidate? Clearly, Cynthia was, um, but is there a certain age, or what, who, who can have this done? Well, we've, the youngest that I've treated is in their 20s, and there's no upper age limit, although dry eyes is more common in the elderly population, in particular more so in women because hormones are a factor as Those well. darn hormones. Yeah. <laughs> they so, get us, don't they? But uh, uh, what we need to do after doing a full eye exam is to do a specific dry eye evaluation. Uh, we analyze the concentration of salt in the tears, we analyze the lipid layer, the oil layer on mm -hmm. the surface of the eye, and we closely evaluate every individual meibomian gland in the lids to see which glands are still viable. Right. Because the purpose is to restore the function of the glands that are blocked, but still viable glands, it were it not for the blockages. Gotcha. Now, Cynthia, tell us after you had the procedure, how are you feeling now? Well, it, I mean, I have my contacts back. You know, uh, there was a, a, a we, he wouldn't let me rush into that. You know, we uh, took some time to make sure and do the count. So about a month later, I believe, we came in. But I, I noticed an immediate difference. My eye felt wetter. Yeah. I mean, literally wetter. And uh, I was in such a habit of putting the drops in, I kind of had to force myself to go. Stop oh, that. Not unless I, <laughs> yeah. I need to do right. that. And um, I, it was just um, well worth the, the money. Oh, I, I just, can imagine. I got my quality of life back. Oh, that's wonderful. So and and, and our viewers can too. And what's so cool is, is you hold these monthly seminars, and, and that's how you found out it about is. the procedure. Mm -hmm. And you can get more information. They're free. And this is a great way to find out if you're a candidate, if, if this Correct. is something that, that would work for you. And all you have to do is go to their website. You sign up for it. Again, it's free. But uh, they have six locations, Medical Center Ophthalmology Associates, so there's got to be one near you. The phone number is 210-697-2020. And, of course, that website, mcoaicare.com. You can get everything you need there. And, again, sign up for one of those monthly seminars. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. It's good to meet you. All right. I'm so glad you can see clearly. Did you know that more and more people are nearsighted these days? Many of those are kids, and some studies show that kids need glasses at an earlier age. One reason is many times that nearsighted people will have nearsighted kids. But what about all these electronics we're using that our kids are glued to all the time that's also straining our eyes and keeping people inside? Well, Dr. Michael Orozco is here as an optometrist, and you have seen what these studies show, I guess, that more and more kids are coming in nearsighted. Yeah, that's true. Definitely increase in nearsightedness uh, over the past 20 years or so. And there's a lot of, uh, I guess, theories about why this is happening, but there's a couple of potential causes that are, that are shown to be uh, pretty strong. Right. Well, there's a, a study that came out at the end of last year that showed a definite connection between uh, exposure to uh, more sunlight, kids that spend more time outside, less likely for their nearsightedness to get worse. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there are some hypotheses as to how that mechanism works, but we don't know that just yet. So all our kids who are, you know, afraid to go outside or complaining they want to sit on their cell phone inside, that actually could cause more nearsightedness than their neighbor who's outside playing. Yeah, the, especially for folks, uh, for kids who have two parents that are nearsighted, it's uh, especially important that they spend time outside. What, uh, what age should kids definitely come in for screening? When, you know, parents come to you and say, I don't know, what should I do with my kid? 
Right. What do you think? Well, pediatricians do a good job of screening kids to about a 20-40 level of vision, but uh, really a thorough comprehensive eye exam with dilation should be done when they're around four years old and they're getting ready to start preschool. That's a, the ideal time to start checking. And as we look at all the screens, a lot of parents uh, used to say, you know, sit away from the TV, you're sitting too close. Get away from the phone, you're sitting too close. What do you tell people? Yeah. Well, uh, sometimes the reason the child is sitting close to the television is because they can't see it if they sit back because they're nearsighted. Uh, but generally, we want to recommend a comfortable, with their fold of the arm, comfortable distance, whether it's on their laptop uh, or whether it's on their iPad or their phone. Um, but as with adults, the key is uh, in moderation, not to spend hours and hours and hours uh, without taking a break and doing something different. And are they more nearsighted when they come in, or, or is there any other metric that you can use to study people that's changed over the years with all the stuff we're using? Um, well, there's various methods to measure how much nearsightedness there is. Um, the, the key is, uh, you know, getting them checked early so that we can take care of their vision at an earlier age uh, and then, of course, monitor them. And uh, you have a practice uh, here, and where is that? Right, a Medical Center Ophthalmology Associates. Uh, we have a group of 12 doctors uh, consisting of optometrists and ophthalmologists. Uh, we have from pediatric specialists to retina specialists. Cataract, everything in between, dry okay. eyes. Even stuff for old people like Delaney and I. From, we say from, from birth to, uh, to the grave, we can cover it all. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Michael Orozco.